Our working memory is where we do our thinking. There's nowhere else in the brain to do our thinking. The long-term memory is just one great vast store of everything we've ever done, known about, thought about. But the working memory is where we do our thinking. As you're listening to this now, your working memory is working because you're thinking about what I'm seeing. You can't stop it, you can't organize it, it just happens. So your working memory is where you think. Even more important is where you do your understanding. Everything that we understand in every area of life, the process that got to understanding was carried out in your working memory. You then store that understanding electronically in your long-term memory. When you're asked a question, your working memory interprets the question and, as it were, looks into the long-term memory to see if it can find an answer. A long time ago, medical people discovered, because of accident victims when they've been hit on the head, that the human memory wasn't just one thing. There were several bits to it. And they started to call a bit of it short-term memory. This is what we now know as working memory, because we now know this part of the brain isn't just for holding things, but actually does things. It's a working memory. That's where we actually do our work. Get someone to solve a lot of problems, complex problems, and certain lights light up. So you can actually say it's got a location. In fact, it seems to have primarily two locations that are linked. And it's very small. It's not only small, it's unalterable. You can't expand it. Whatever you've got, you got it genetically. And it's not neatly and directly linked to intelligence or ability. It's just part of the way your brain happens to be wired up. Yes, if you do an intelligence test, you'll find you do better at it. You've got a bigger working memory, but that's just a function of intelligence tests. But I doubt if they're measuring intelligence. They're measuring something completely different. Because what Miller found was that almost the entire population of adults, the working memory capacity lies between five and nine. But most are fairly average at about seven. What was then found was that the working memory, the capacity of it grew with age. So if you're 16, you've got your full working memory. But if you're only 14, you've got one unit less. If you're 12, you've got two units less on average, and so on. And we teachers have been used to this for years. We don't teach highly complex things to young children. We leave them till later. We build up the idea steadily over time. Let's go back a little bit and look at the history of how research actually led to this understanding about its size. And this goes back a very long way to some brilliant work done in the 1950s by a psychologist called Miller. And Miller found many ways, simple tests he could give people, where he could measure the size of a person's working memory. In those days he didn't call it working memory, he called it short-term memory. What Miller found was quite amazing. You take a sample of adults, and by an adult, anybody over 16, you will find that the average working memory capacity in the population anywhere in the world, men and women equal, the average is seven. In other words, we can hold seven pieces of information at the same time. You can try it out for yourself by seeing how many numbers you can remember accurately from an unfamiliar telephone number. And if you've got seven, you will find that you start to struggle about seven. What counts as one? Well, there's no hard and fast rule to that because it's what you see as one. So if you see a mathematical equation, let's say in say physics, so you've got speed of a wave motion, frequency and wavelength, and you see that as one, then your working memory handles it as one. So an equation relationship like that can actually group things together. Interestingly enough, Miller, way back in the 1950s, he spotted this and he called it chunking, mm. where you bring several things together and they're seen as one, and he said it's chunking. Therefore, the brain sees it as one. But what you see as one thing may not be what I see as one, one thing. thing. And your students in the classroom, they won't necessarily see it as one because they're novice learners. You may see it as one, it's easy to you, but they may see it as three, four, five mm. things, and they struggle with it. This information was well known, but lay in an erudite journal published in the United States for a long time. And various other people had worked at things, and they'd looked at how the brain was working when we actually handle information. 
and it looked at the kind of things that people were doing, and it had come up with all sorts of very useful models which are very strongly supported by the research evidence. We are bombarded with information. If we took everything in that came at us, our brains would go up on a puff of blue smoke. We wouldn't cope. Our brains naturally filter everything that comes through our eyes, our ears, and all our senses. And a small amount goes into the working memory. And when it gets there, we start to process it, to make sense of it, to interpret it. A Scotsman, Alec Johnson, with his research team, was looking at the kind of areas in the sciences that were causing difficulties for learners, especially school learners. Eventually, one of his research team spotted what she thought was the reason for the problems. And in one of these wonderful eureka moments, when she was sitting there surrounded by pieces of paper covered with data, she suddenly said, I see it, I see it. It's to do with information load. Alec Johnson, a retired professor from Glasgow University now, and Natalie Kellett, the student who's working with them, then started to comb the literature to find out what was known about the way we process information. They came across many of the papers that related to the way the human brain processes information. And they came upon the paper about the limited capacity of working memory. And suddenly, the genius of Alec Johnson spotted the connection. The reason why things are difficult in learning is because the working memory capacity is limited. And in a moment of clear thinking, he realized what makes things difficult for learners is the problem of the limitations of working memory. In other words, if we're trying to understand something and the number of ideas we've got to hold and manipulate at the same time is too great and it won't fit into our limited working memory, which cannot be expanded, then we will find it virtually impossible to understand, no matter how hard we try. The working memory capacity controls understanding. Now he spotted this, but it was just a hypothesis in his mind. So he set about setting up experiments to test this. And in a major experiment done in the 1980s, he measured with a colleague from Egypt the working memory capacity of a large number of first-year university students. They measured the capacity of their working memories by two different methods which turned out to give almost the same answer for every student. But they only chose the students where the answers the two methods gave were identical. They then set these students a whole range of problems in a kind of assessment or examination, and they looked at the number of ideas that had to be held by the students in order to be able to solve these problems. And they found to their amazement that not only as the number of ideas increased, and you can see this on the graph, the performance dropped. In fact, the problem, the performance dropped cataclysmically when the number of things they had to hold at the same time came to about six, almost the same as the average working memory capacity.